Hello, and welcome to The Pillar Diaries, episode number 15, featuring Sister Claudia Teresa Perez. Sister Perez was born in Zamora, Mexico. She was raised in Illinois until about the age of 12, then moved to Texas, where they have resided until about two years ago. Sister Perez graduated from Texas Bible College in 1987 with a degree in Christian education and Christian counseling. This is where she met her now husband, Brother Perez. They have been married for 35 years. They share five beautiful children, two daughter-in-laws, one son-in-law, and seven beautiful grandchildren. Together, they have been in ministry for over 30 years, most of which was in Texas. Sister Claudia served as the National Spanish Ladies Director for the UPCI and the Director for Sunday School and Children's Ministry for the Texas District. They served on the National Spanish Committee and served for four states in the National Spanish Ministry. God called them to the city of Knoxville two years ago to help their son at the Spanish Ministry and their work at FAC. She's currently a full-time kindergarten teacher at their Christian school there in Knoxville. In her free time, she enjoys writing, cooking for family and friends, and spending time with her family. Sister Perez shows the power of a prayerful mother and a faithful God. His word tells us his promises never return void. When we have done all we can do and we turn it over to him, it's amazing what he will do with that. If we just hold on during the storm, that very storm can become our greatest miracle. Listen to this stone as it cries the beauty of his goodness. These women are our pillars and their stories are our monuments. If we ever fail to tell their stories, what they have built will crumble. These are their diaries. I am Claudia Perez and I am from uh, Houston, Texas. We moved here two years ago to First Apostolic uh, Church of Knoxville under Pastor Mark McCool. We came here to help our son with the Spanish work. He is the Spanish pastor, uh, Primera Iglesia Apostolica, and we are excited to be here to help him minister. We give Bible studies, evangelize, disciple, whatever he needs us to help him with. We've been having great revival in the last month. We baptized uh, 11 people and um, we're excited. We're excited for what God is doing here. I was born in Mexico, but I was raised in Illinois, in Chicago, Illinois. Um, I was brought there when I was three years old. I was there till about 10 or 11 years old when my parents uh, separated. My mother fled from a domestic violence environment. Uh, she fled with four, of her, four out of her seven children we came to Texas um, with one of her good friends. We were in Texas, um, uh, well, till about two years ago. That's where my home is. Um, my uh, mother, um, not long after that, uh, was uh, in her apartment and heard a door knock. And uh, it so happened, it wasn't a coincidence, I know it was God, a life tabernacle under Pastor uh, Kilgore, James Kilgore. They were out door knocking, inviting people to church. And um, it so happened that a Puerto Rican who knew Spanish knocked at my mom's door. I know it wasn't a coincidence, I knew it was God. She knocked at the right door at the right time because she found a woman that was broken, that was uh, scared, that was uh, unsure of her future for her and her children. Um, so uh, this sister, Sister Diane, was able to introduce my mother to Pentecost. And she, from that day on, she invited my mother to church. She picked us up in her small little gray Honda, put us all in the car with her daughter, took us to church to every service there was. Um, she brought it, she picked us up and she would take us to church. And when there wasn't any service, she'd bring Bible studies to our home. Shortly after that, introduced us to Sister uh, Linda, who took upon herself and got a burden for us and brought all night prayer meetings to our home. And you'd think they would send us little kids to bed. No, we were part of the all night prayer meeting. And I 
At that time, I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't understand all the singing and the clapping and the speaking in tongues and running and uh, kind of scared me, you know, a little bit. I didn't know what to expect. Um, but after a while, I, I would just see my mom. I, I felt like, you know, she would smile more and it was something good. It was something good for our family. Something good had happened to us. Um, Shortly after that, there was a Spanish church starting, and our family was one of the, well, the first Spanish family that started the Spanish work at Life Tabernacle. And um, I remember uh, one service after they uh, uh, assigned a Spanish pastor, which was Pastor Joe Rios, and um, he was preaching a message. He was preaching about a father that loves, a father that cares, a father that protects, a father that will never fail you. And that hit home for me. That, that, that hit home for me because at that moment, I had never felt that from a masculine figure. I didn't know what it was. I had a father, a present father, but I just never felt that security or that love. You know, my siblings may say different, but that was, that hit home for me. And I remember crying the whole message and I didn't even know why I was crying. I just felt something good. I felt like this is what I want for my mother. This is what I want for my siblings. This is what I want for my family. This is something good. And I ended up in the altar, walking to the altar and crying. I, I don't remember how, I just remember it was a long time. I just wept and wept and I couldn't even talk till I found myself speaking in other tongues and got baptized. That was August 9th of 1983. And I'll never forget that day because that day marked a special day in my life. That's the day I, 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 uh, the Lord found me and I had a connection with him and I fell in love with, I didn't know a lot, I didn't understand a lot, but I knew it was something good. It was something better than what we had had and from what I was coming from. And I could see just daily changes in my mother and you know, the struggle was still real. The problems weren't resolved and the issues weren't resolved, but I could see her smile more. I could see, you know, good things happening to us through, through, uh, you know, through the days and through the months. And, you know, eventually my mother got baptized, I got baptized, my siblings got baptized. And, you know, we just felt like uh, different and happy. And like I said, things weren't resolved immediately, but things got better for us as time passed. I can say that I served God in my young years and I had a very, very uh, good youth. I served God with all my heart. I served as a youth secretary. We had a wonderful youth pastor who made living for God fun. He, um, Brother Samuel Herrera and Sister Patsy Herrera, I will never forget them. They are special people in my life because they taught me that church is fun, living for God is fun. And with, they, with that, I'm not saying that they had us bowling or playing ball, or they did at times, but most of our, my memories in the young people or in the youth serving God was all night prayer meetings and seeing young people get the Holy Ghost. To me, that was like awesome, you know? So one more that is being renewed, is being uh, changed, is being transformed, you know? And um, street services and door knocking and inviting people to church. To me, that was fun. To me, that was, that brought joy to me to see a soul that came to church, a young person that came to church with all kinds of issues and depression and oppression, and then get up from that altar or get out of the baptistry with a big smile. To me, that reminded me of the day that I felt that joy in my heart or that peace in my heart, that connection that I had with God. And um, so I have to say that my youth years serving God, to, I have wonderful memories, beautiful memories. And um, it, it, I just learned that serving God was the most beautiful thing there was. I married a young minister in training. And very shortly after we married, uh, we went to Bible school together. Right out of Bible school, our pastor assigned us to a church in Nacogdoches, Texas. And at a very young age, 21 or something like that, I became a pastor's wife. I had no idea what we were doing. I was scared. I didn't want to go. I had my family in my church. I grew up in the church. I saw the church grow from being in a gym where we had to set up to owning a beautiful building with a large congregation, wonderful pastors. 
and just a beautiful church. And I didn't want to leave all that to go. You know, it was only three hours away, but I didn't want to leave that. I didn't want to go. I, I loved my church. I loved the way my church served God. I loved everything about it. There was problems, there was issues, there was criticism, but to me that was secondary at that time. That was secondary. I just, so we became pastors at a very young age. We uh, became the pioneer pastors of the church in Nacogdoches. We were there for nine years and things happened and we ended up being the pastors, voted in as pastors of the mother church. We came back as pastors of our mother church. And talk about being scared. You know, you come back and pastor the kids you grew up with, the young people you hanged around with, the, you know, the people that called you, you know, hey, Claudia, let's, you know, let's go play, let's go do this, let's go hang out. Now you were their pastor's wife. You know, the shoes that the Rios were leaving were not, you know, easy shoes to fit. They were great people great man and, and a great lady of God, just that we learned so much from them. And coming into the, into this church, it was not an easy thing. It was, I think, the hardest thing. It was definitely a school for me, definitely a school for me. And I learned so many things. Um, someone once told me during my transition in this ministry, we were there for 16 years. And I'm not saying that the people were mean or bad to us. Don't misunderstand me. They were beautiful people. They, they loved us. They, take care, they took care of us, took care of our children. They, they served us in ways that I'd never felt I deserved it. And so don't misunderstand me when I say that. It was a very hard transition for me. I had to learn to love, to forgive unconditionally. I had to learn to smile when inside all I wanted to do was crawl under a bed and not come out. And please don't misunderstand, they are beautiful people. But things happen. And um, as years kept going, I thought, well, things will get better. You know, but envy on our surroundings, false accusations, just different things took place, so many details that, you know, I take ownership for whatever I may have caused or done or not done right, but everything else, I just put it under the blood because it is something that I felt the Lord allowed it for me to grow, for me to be a better person, for me to be a better wife, a better mother, and definitely to learn the true meaning of love and forgiveness. And I chose that. Someone once told me that. He says, Sister Claudia, when we go through trials and problems, you have this decision in your hand. You choose to let that problem destroy you or to allow that problem to teach you and mature you and purge you into a better person. And I chose to be purged. I chose to be a better person. I chose, I wasn't perfect. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not the angel here. I just chose to keep going, keep smiling, keep giving, keep praying, keep fasting, keep encouraging, keep hugging those people that probably I felt like choking sometimes, you know, but um, it wasn't an easy transition. It was not easy. Those 16 years were not easy. And I don't misunderstand me. Those, you know, they loved us. They loved our children. They spoiled us. Honestly, they did. I don't know a more, uh, a, a better church in the sense of spoiling leadership than this church. They were just top notch because that's the way the previous pastors were. When we were under their leadership, we were there for them 100%. We, they taught us to honor ministry. So we taught them, and they were already taught that way. We honor ministry. We don't question. We let God deal with that. And um, that brought us to the hardest of all my trials. And, and those 16 years were not easy. There's so much detail. There's so much stuff that I asked the Lord, do you want me to share any of that? And it compromises some people, and I'd, I'd rather leave it under the blood. But that took me to, uh, in the middle of the, the 
hardest part of our trial. I'm talking about just turmoil among the, the, the board and just ministry, just something that broke me to, there was just no other way to be broken. It was just, or at least I felt I was broken to pieces and you couldn't break any more pieces because it was just shattered. One of my sons who was raised in church, all my kids were raised in church. I have five children, four boys and a, and a girl and a daughter. Um, they're all wonderful kids. What can I say, right? <laughs> um, but one of my sons, I, I just started noticing different attitudes and different behavior and um, just calls after calls from school and, um, you know, appearances to court because of truancy and fighting. And it seemed it got to the point where I ended up going to school almost every day for one thing or another, started dressing different, started wearing bling blings and wearing clothes five times his size and, you know, acting in ways that I knew he was either doing drugs or drinking. Something was not right. And, and you know, we would try to communicate with him. We try to see where he was going, what he was doing, checking his bags. You know, he still had all his nice clothes in his closet. He still had all his nice suits and ties and, you know, everything in his room in his closet. And he would go dressed one way to school and come back dressed another way. And, and then all of a sudden he didn't care what we'd say. You know, he just did whatever he felt he wanted to do. And many times um, I wouldn't see him for days. I didn't know where he was. I would cry myself to sleep thinking, is he okay? Where is he? You know, where did I go wrong? Where, where, that was my question. God, where did, I, where did I go wrong? We've given so much. We've, you know, there you go trying to, you know, justify, you know, things, I guess. I don't know. Um, as a mother, I would cry and I would, till I had no more tears. I would cry myself to sleep many nights during those three, four years that I battled with this battle with our son. Um, uh, till one day, I mean, and I'm talking fights and, truancy and court for this and court for that and the probation officer even being in uh, in house um, where they're they're jailed but they're in home in home uh, I don't remember what that is called but he had to be at home at a certain hour and when he would disappear I would go crazy looking for him because he had to be home because they would call and if he wasn't there then he you know it was just a lot of tension up on top of all the turmoil that we were living with the church and just the whole situation that was just killing us to pieces anyway. Um, uh, I remember going to, to many courts and many meetings with teachers and counselors and probation officers. And um, I remember one time this whole gang came to my house like chains and bats and they just got off this truck and they started banging our door and he was upstairs. And I know the Lord gave him a profound sleep that he did not hear the bangs and the, you know, calling out for him. Cause I know at that particular moment, he would have came down thinking he's King Kong and would have, you know, confronted them. But I know God intervened to the point where he was so sound asleep. He did not hear these people knocking and banging at our doors. And my husband says, I have to come out and face them. And I would tell him, don't open the door, call the cops. Don't, you know, we, I was afraid that they were gonna come do something to him or to us. And I remember my husband says, God's not gonna allow it. God's not gonna allow it. He came out, I don't know what they saw. I don't know what they felt. But the minute my husband came out and opened the door and they saw him, I don't know, they just all fled back into their truck and they took off and we never heard from them again. They never came to bother, at least not in our home. And, um, and just different things. And throughout all of this, I remember questioning God, why? Why me, why us? Where did I go wrong? You know, just questioning. And I found myself not praying, 
I have to confess, I was not praying for my son. I was boohooing and crying and poor me and why us? Why me? Where did I go wrong? Uh, you know, just cry, 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 cry. And until I had no more tears, till I was literally dehydrated on the floor because I was just in so much pain because my son, you know, was out, I don't know where, doing I don't know what. And I knew he was in danger. And I remember I got a call one day and it was his probation officer. And he said, Miss Claudia, if you don't take your son out of here, out of this school, out of this neighborhood, out of this whole environment, I would say three months if that, he's gonna either be in jail for a long time or he's gonna be six feet under. So you're gonna to have to do something with this boy. He had court a few days after that. And I told my husband, I can't go. I don't even wanna know. I don't wanna hear you go. He called me and he said, they just detained him. They cuffed him up and took him to the back. He was being so disrespectful to the judge, being rude and talking back. The judge got so upset and they told, he told them, cough him up and take him in. And so he said, just pray, ask the Lord to intervene because I, I have no idea if they're gonna keep him. They wanna send him to juvenile camp and we know what that could happen. You know, those, sometimes they get worse and just his attitude and his behavior. And I knew he was doing things and probably doing kinds of drugs that would make him do things that he probably didn't even know he was doing. And I remember those words from the probation officer and I, I was just sit there and crying. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? So I went upstairs to his room. I lay down on the floor and I started just booing. I wasn't praying. I'll confess that now. I thought I was praying. And I was just crying and saying, God, why? Why us? Don't you see that we have enough with all that is going on? We're fighting to the left. We're fighting to the right. We're fighting this person. We're fighting that person. You know, we're being attacked from everywhere. And the hardest part of it all, as a mother, was the people that gave their back to us because they felt like, we were not worthy of ministry for having a son that way. As a mother, I felt like, you know, we restored your son at one point. We restored your daughter at one point, but now our son is full of leprosy and you can't let your kids hang around or you can't come around or if we come to church, he can't sit with your kids or, you know, I literally had to sit him between me and my other kids so that, you know, other kids were not, he would not be around other kids. It was just a very, as a mother who was seeking for someone to reach out to him, maybe I couldn't, maybe someone could, he was being rejected by the people I thought should have embraced him. And I don't blame them. I feel like it was all in God's plan. I remember being in that room and crying and asking God, who do I turn to? Where do I go? And I'm not a super spiritual person. I don't want you to get that perception of me. But I did hear God that day. An audible voice asking me a question. He said, Claudia, do you believe I can reach your son? Do you believe, do you trust me? Do you believe that I can and will and want to bring your boy home? And I remember being so dehydrated from so much crying and I just remember saying, yes, God, I believe. I believe, I believe with all my heart. And the Lord said to me, worship me, praise me, thank me. I really didn't know what he was trying to tell me. I was so consumed in my own pity, because that's what it was. I was in pain, yes, but I was so consumed by poor me, you know, look at what's happening to me. And all of this is never about us. It's about how great he is and how great, oh, what great wonders he can do. But we forget about those things when we let our problems blind us and the pain blind us. And pain becomes greater than the God that we serve. And that's a dangerous part, a place to be in, a dangerous place because then comes the pitfall in our lives. So I remember getting up, cleaning my face, and I went to his room. He wasn't there. 
he, I don't know where he was, I don't remember. Might have been, I don't know, he would sometimes sneak out and go into his room. I remember going to the garage because he had thrown all his church clothes in the garage, all his nice clothes in a box and throw them in the garage. I went to the garage and I put all of his clothes back in the closet, in the drawers, his ties, his suits. I got his Bible out of the boxes, put it on the side of his bed, and I did his bed, and I wrote scriptures on cardboards and put them all over his room. And I just laid in on that bed and I just had church. I had church, I started praising God, dancing in the spirit, put music. I went crazy in the spirit and I just, and from that moment, did things get better? They got worse. He just got deeper and deeper in sin. And after much thought, my husband and I decided, you know, our son's life is in, in the line. And as much as I love ministry, I told him, as much as I promised you I would follow you wherever God would take you, my son's first. And I will not move forward without him. I will not go forward in ministry with you without him. We've restored so many lives. I don't think it's the will of God for us to let our son lose out on what could be the greatest thing in his life. And for the first time, I think he saw how serious it was. Maybe he, he realized it, but never showed emotion or never showed, you know, like me. <laughs> I was always crying about it, but for the first time I saw like concern in his face and in his voice. And he said, well, we have to do it. We took we made the decision to resign from ministry, step down from the church. With all the other stuff that was going on, we felt it was the best thing for our family at that moment. Did we make the right decision? I don't know. At that moment, that seemed like the best decision. Uh, <clears throat> the very few people that I counseled with that I felt I could speak to, they would say, run, get out of here, go. It's the best thing you can do. So my husband and I, that's what we did. And he wrote a resignation letter and wrote it and let, read it to the church and we resigned. We moved to a small town called Willis, Texas. <laughs> we went to a beautiful church where that became the healing bridge for my family. That became the bridge that took us to restoration and healing as a family, because we had been going through so much for so long that in our emotional commotion, we couldn't probably make the best decisions, but we felt at that moment that was the best one to do, especially because of our son. We moved, I remember, I don't even remember if I sold things or if I gave them away or what happened with all the stuff that we had, the house. In my mind, all I wanted was to go, to leave, close that door, and move on. And all I cared about was my son, my family, our sanity. I wanted to be able to breathe again. There was a point in my life during this whole turmoil that I got myself in my car and I drove and I said, I'm just gonna drive till there's no more where, nowhere else to go. Just if I fall in a lake, if I crash against the wall, it will probably end. This pain, this suffocation will end. And I remember getting a phone call and I wasn't gonna answer it because all I wanted was to disappear. I wanted to be able to breathe. I felt like I, I couldn't breathe, like I couldn't. There was no peace in me. There was no joy. I wanted to find that. And I felt maybe this way, I'll be able to find peace. And I remember I got a phone call.
And it was just simple words. Whatever you're going to do, don't do it. Don't do it. God hasn't forgotten you yet. He's got your back. Stop and don't do it. And she hung up. And that was it. And I remember pulling over and I said, oh my God, what am I doing? How selfish. How ungrateful can you be, Claudia? How can you even think about leaving your children without a mother or a husband without a wife? The pain that you would cause them. I remember composing myself and going back home. And um, we arrived to this church in Willis, Texas, and beautiful people, wonderful people. They embraced us, they loved us, they took care of us, um, and they were having a revival. And um, their revival just kept going on because it was good every night, and I had never experienced anything like that before. You know, in the Spanish culture, you don't see that much and I had always been in Spanish churches, and it was one of our first experiences with English churches, and so they were having revival, and they tomorrow will continue, and the next day, and it kept going on, and I remember one day, sitting in the back, one of the back pews, and, and I remember just telling the Lord, you've asked me to praise you, and I'm, I'm just gonna praise you. I closed my eyes, and I just started thanking him and worshiping him, and I remember putting my head down and just thanking God for bringing us there and for allowing the process for healing for our family and telling the Lord, you know, I don't know if we did the right thing, but at the moment this feels good. You know, it feels good and, and, and something good's gonna happen. And I thank you and I praise you. When all of a sudden I hear a lot of screaming and dancing and shouting and, you know, and I look up or someone came to get me. I don't remember the exact how it all happened, but my son, my son was in an altar, pouring his heart, heart out to God, crying out to God, and the Lord restored his life. It wasn't at that moment, but it was the beginning. And if you ask me what was the greatest moment of my life, that was the greatest moment of my life. To see my son weep before the presence of God, cry out to God and he would pull his bling bling and he would pull his clothes like he knew that wasn't him. He had had that encounter with God and he, you could see that he was fighting between the flesh and the spirit and, and then just every day the small changes. Those moments were my greatest moments. Those moments were giving oxygen to my life. Those moments were bringing joy to my heart peace to my heart. I could care less of everything I lost. I could care less of our reputation. And let me tell you, our reputation was under the bridge. They said everything you could think of about us. But at that moment, I could care less. And it was just an everyday, everyday changes when he started, you know, dressing properly and differently anyway. And you know, he started witnessing to people, to young people and bringing them to church and telling his story and telling his testimony. Those were my great moments with God. I knew without a doubt that I served a big God, a real God, a God that never left me, a God that never abandoned me. I allowed my pain. I, I, I allowed my, my self-pity blind me from the God that I was serving. But to me at that moment, that was my miracle. And the day I heard him preach and saw him preach in a service, let me tell you, there was no happier woman in this world than me. I sat in that pulpit, in that pew, and I wept and wept and wept like a baby. Every word he would say, every move he would do, just to see him up there preaching. And I wasn't crying because I was sad. I was crying because I was so grateful for a merciful God that was mindful of me and this boy. And to me, if I had to tell you what was my greatest moment, 
and how I know and how God proved himself to me. That was the seal of it all. And today he's a Spanish pastor of Primera Iglesia Apostolica. And I am just, I mean, he's not perfect, but every time I see him, every time, I see him ministering in, in, in his role and worshiping God in, in, in uh, First Apostolic Church of Knoxville. And he's up there in the front worshiping with his little boy. Oh, you don't know what that does to me because it takes me back to those three, four years of hell that I lived. And um, I'm just blessed, blessed. And to top it off, my youngest son went through something familiar. similar than him, but I already knew the power of God. I didn't pity party and I didn't become bitter and angry. I praised God through the whole process. And today he's ministering along his side in Primera Iglesia Apostolica. And to see those boys up there, one preaching and one translating, or the other preaching and the other translating and outwinning souls or praying for people in the altar, you don't know what that does to me. It's just, it's an overwhelming feeling and the reminder of the God that we serve. Living for God brings so many rewards, so many satisfaction, so much satisfaction. It's, I would be lying to you if I'm gonna tell you that it's a perfect life, that it's all roses and no, uh, you know, trouble or pain, um, because it's not true. But I can say that from the very beginning, when I saw the Lord come into our home with the way my mother was changing and each one of the things that I've experienced in life with me and my children, um, the peace that comes with it, the uh, security, the assurance that everything is going to be okay. You know, things may look black for us, but if we just keep focus on him and don't distract ourselves with the problem, we have that assurance that he is there, that he is faithful. And to know that and believe it and trust in that, I don't see that there's a greater reward than that. I don't know that there's a greater resource in that than to know that he is real, that he is there, that he is present when you need him and he wants to be there. What greater reward than that? Who are we that he would be so mindful of the minimal things in our life? The things that to us are huge to him are like, settle down, honey, I got this. I got your back. That would be my greatest reward in, 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 in serving the Lord and I don't know that I would want it any other way. The uh, greatest influence in my life would have to be two women. There's so many women in my life and, and going through Bible school, one of our teachers always taught us to always have a older woman in your life that, you could, that can mentor you, to have a woman your age that you can laugh with and pull your hair down and just be yourself and relax and have a younger woman where you can always invest yourself in. But the two greatest women in my life that have impacted till today are my first pastor's wife, Sister Rios. She taught me to love people. She taught me that people didn't care so much what I knew or how much Bible I knew. But she said, people wanna know how much you care. And if you care for people, and they know that you care for them, they're gonna love you. She taught me to serve. She always said it's better to serve than to be served. And God called us to serve. And she taught me by example. I remember the first time she asked me to speak in a ladies conference, the very first ladies conference that I ever attended. She wanted me to be one of the speakers. And I told her, there is no way I can do that. And she said, we can do all things through Christ which strengthen us. So if God lives in you, the God in you will use your mouth to deliver a word. And God put in my heart for you to deliver the word and you, God will put that word in you. So I learned obedience. 
And to this day, I think I am a people's person because of her. I saw her mingle with people. I saw her hug people, people that you wouldn't want to hug, people that you thought, ooh, you know, you know, she was out there serving, giving, cooking, cleaning. I learned that value from her. And then next and the greatest, my mother. My mother, there's no words like to describe this woman. She wasn't a preacher. She wasn't a lady on the platform. She wasn't one to be on the front lines. But she taught me to love God with all of my heart and all of my mind. She taught me to love the Word of God. She said, Claudia, you have to love this Word, you have to read this Word, and you have to live this Word. You don't preach this Word until you live it and you love it. And she taught me to pray. She would call me many times at 4 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. She wouldn't say anything. She would just start speaking in tongues <laughs> on the phone, and I knew it was her. And then she'd call me later on in the day. I just felt from the Lord to pray for you at that time. Whatever is coming your way, God's got it. So I learned to pray. She taught me that life without prayer was a game, and nothing good was going to come out of it. She taught me to, and the greatest lesson of all, to forgive. She would tell me, Claudia, forgive and forgive again and forgive again. For they know not what they're doing because what they do to you, they do it unto the Lord and he'll take care of it. Vengeance is not supposed to be in our heart or in our hands. It's not from God and it's not for the people of God and you are a child of God. You forgive. Beyond your strength, you forgive. So her not being present in some of the most hard, hard trials of my life, those words kept me and taught me, first, to love people, regardless. Keep loving, keep smiling, keep hugging their neck in spite of whatever they said or did. To forgive them because they didn't know what they were doing and God took care of all of it. She taught me to wait in God. She taught me a lesson one time and I try to teach it to my children and have throughout the years. She said, we live life like a, um, a, a light sign. There's a yellow, there's a red, and there's a green. When we come to prayer, we don't come to prayer to twist God's hand. We come to prayer for direction for that day. So you cannot afford, you cannot give yourself the luxury to walk out of your house without prayer, whether it's five minutes, whether it's an hour, because that's where you start your day. And the Lord may tell you, green, uh, red light, that's telling you, no, don't go there, don't do that, don't say that. Or he may say, yellow light for that day. Wait, be patient, caution, Think about it. Or he may say, green light, go for it. It's yours. You got it. This is the day. It's yours. It belongs to you. This is your victory. And I have tried to be that person, to be a person of prayer and the word, because I know I can't give myself that luxury to walk out the door without God being in front of me and guiding me for whatever day. So if I could say the two most influential women in my life would be my first pastor's wife and my mother, because till this day, I still hear their voices <laughs> in every situation in our lives and ministry that uh, I'm able to work in. If I could give uh, the younger generation an advice would be, first of all, love God with all of your heart. Love him with all of your might. And um, one thing that I could say and that I feel like it's so very, very important for this next generation or this generation that is rising, that um, serving God and having an intimacy with God is essential. It's not an option. It's not if you want to or if, or if you know, well, I'm going to live for God 
I have my parents' blessing. I have my parents' inheritance. I have my parents' uh, covering. I have my church covering, my youth pastor's covering, or, or my leadership covering. That all that is important and very essential, but not more essential than your connection, your intimacy with God on a daily basis. Like my mother told me, whether it be five minutes, 10 minutes, or an hour, but have that connection daily with God. Because you cannot pretend or, or to, to live for God a successful life, a, a successful Christian walk with God. And there's not two lives. There's not a Christian walk and a worldly walk. There's not a, a, a Sunday walk and a Monday through Saturday life. It's one life that we live. And that life should be a life pleasing to our creator, to God. So if I can tell this younger generation from what I see and I've experienced just watching in their conversations and their behavior, there's got to be an intimacy, an intimacy with God. Because when things happen in life, when pain comes, when bitterness or anger or trial or difficulties, that's what's going to hold us. Because God doesn't throw away the broken. God brings it, recharges it, and uses it. God is not in the business of throwing away things. God is in the business of, of restoring. And we won't be able to experience that if we're lingering on to the world and the things of the world and, and seeking for uh, satisfaction in the things of the world. We have to have that intimacy with God, that daily communication. And when I say intimacy, I'm talking about a connection with Him. Just like your buddy, your best friend. If you don't talk to your best friend for a day or two, that's okay. Three, four days, you know, every week, well, then she's not your best friend. She's not your buddy, buddy. She's not, or your husband or your spouse. You don't go a, a day without talking to your spouse. How do you think God would feel when you go a day or two or three or a week without talking to Him? You know, are we in this or are we not? Is, is God real in your life or is he not? Do you believe it or you don't? It's either you do or you don't. 